Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rose. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we are very pleased to bring you science seminars in partnership with the St. Louis Zoo. Many of you are Academy members and friends, and for those of you who are not, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are a local nonprofit organization. We've been around for a very long time, since 1856, and it's been our mission to promote the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation. We offer a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming for teens, adults, families, middle school students, and educators that include citizen science and inquiry-based learning opportunities, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours that highlight science at venues throughout the region. You can find more information on the Academy and our community-wide events, public talks, and programs by visiting the website at academyofsciencestl.org. You may also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some of our literature that is outside the auditorium on your way out. If you're interested in helping to support the Academy's many science opportunities for students and adults, there is membership information also at the table outside the auditorium, or I'd be more than happy to talk with you after tonight's presentation. If you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy public lectures and events, there are some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. If you're a student and you need to verify attendance, we will have cards you can pick up from us tonight also out at the Academy table outside the auditorium and after tonight's talk. Um, I do want to mention a couple upcoming events you might have an interest in attending. And in particular, you might want to mark your calendars for the next in our science seminar series talks here at the zoo. Um, before I do that, when you came in tonight, you may have picked up one of these or been handed one of these survey cards. So if you could take a moment to fill these out, these are really important to us. They give us some idea of what you think about the series and what you might like to see. Um, and we take that into consideration as we plan for upcoming uh, events and years. And uh, then in terms of upcoming events, tomorrow night, I did want to mention tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we have Christina Figueroa Soto. She's a fellow in biological anthropology PhD candidate with the Forensic Anthropology Center at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She's here in St. Louis at Kirkwood High School as part of our pioneering science series to speak on forensic anthropology and the center's ongoing research that assists law enforcement and medical examiners. The university's Forensic Anthropology Center is widely recognized internationally for its research on human decomposition and modern human biological variation and its vast donated skeletal collection of more than 1,100 individuals is the largest collection of contemporary human skeletons in the U.S. The talk is free and open to the public, and you do not need to register to attend. St. Louis Zoo Herpetology and Aquatics Curator and Director of the Zoo's Wild Care Institute Center for Conservation in Western Asia, Jeff Etling, talks about nine years of Armenian viper conservation efforts on March 12 at 7.30 p.m. here in the living world. And as part of our conservation conversation series in partnership with the St. Louis Zoo. And then one of the world's foremost Alzheimer's disease researchers and 2013 Academy Outstanding St. Louis Scientist, Peter H. Raven, Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Dr. John Morse, will be here in the living world on April 2 at 7.30 to talk about advances in Alzheimer's disease research as part of our science seminar series. And that's on April 2. And you can find even more science opportunities, talks and tours on the Academy website or listed on the event flyers and Academy literature that's available for you to take with you before you head out this evening. So with all of that said, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Graham Fisher. Dr. Fisher received his BSc in physics from the University of Salford in England and his PhD in materials science from the University of London in 1986. He is a trustee of the Academy of Science St. Louis and currently chief scientist for Sun Edison, Inc. Sun Edison, by the way, is a major supporter of the Academy of Science St. Louis Science Fair, one of the world's largest regional science fairs held each year out at Queenie Park. So a quick thank you to Dr. Fisher and Sun Edison for their instrumental roles in fostering the next generation and making possible this important hands-on inquiry-based exploration of science for area students. Dr. Fisher joined Sun Edison in 1985 and has held various positions within the manufacturing and R&D organizations and currently leads the Emerging Technologies Research Group. Prior to joining Sun Edison, he worked for the General Electric Company in England for 12 years. He has lived and worked in England, Italy, and the U.S. and is author or co-author of over 60 published papers and two patents. And he is here with us tonight to talk about the heart of today's modern electronics, semiconductors, and from sand to silicon. 
On behalf of the Academy of Science St. Louis and the St. Louis Zoo, won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Graham Fisher. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Rose, for the introduction. So this evening, are we ready to learn something about silicon? Everybody, everybody happy with that? I see one or two nods, good. You're in the right place then, hopefully. So uh, what I thought I would do, rather than just talk about how silicon is made, I want to start off with something about electric circuits because uh, there are some important material properties uh, in electric circuits that we need to understand in order to understand semiconductors. And we'll get through a little bit of that. I'm going to introduce some semiconductor physics. Um, hopefully you won't all fall asleep at that point. And then eventually I'll get into talking about um, why silicon relative to other semiconductors and then how, how do we make silicon? And finally, what do we do once we've made it? So breaking this down into three areas, we're gonna talk about uh, why silicon, once we know why, how do we make it? And then once we've made it, what do we do with it? Okay, so before I do that, very quickly, in case anybody wants to know, this is what Sun Edison does. We start off with a polysilicon product. Uh, we can grow a crystal of silicon, we make it into wafers and sell it to the people that make computer chips. They typically put a pattern on the wafer, looks something like this, and afterwards, by the way, I've got some show and tell things down the front. You can see examples of these wafers. And then they're diced up, put into packages, and they come into your homes in the form of cell phones or uh, computers, and even toasters have chips in them these days. It's amazing. Uh, so lots of things like that. Uh, Sun Edison also uh, makes ingots for the solar industry, and the wafers look like this. You can see a little bit different. These are square, these are round. Um, then uh, we sell them to people that make these uh, solar cells and put them in panels. And then there's another division of Sun Edison that is, uh, would be over here. That's the energy division, and they actually buy panels and install them all around the world. They're in fact, the second largest installer of solar panels in the world. But this evening, I'm gonna concentrate on this line of uh, products, um, and uh, hopefully that'll be of interest. If there's any questions about the solar side, I can take those afterwards. Um, we've got about 90 minutes, a little less. Uh, what I thought I would do is invite you to ask questions as, as I go along, rather than wait to the end. Um, so if anybody has a question while I'm talking, I can just about see you from here. So uh, please just uh, wave, uh, and when I see your hand, I'll stop at the next convenient juncture and, and take a question. And we'll see if we can get all this done in, in 90 minutes. Okay, so in electric circuits, uh, we can draw them out like this. Simple battery, some wires, a little switch here, and if the switch is closed like that, the light goes on. Uh, if we look at it, uh, in a photograph of a simple circuit like this, we've got some interesting things. Uh, different materials here. We've got uh, wood, uh, we've got wires with some insulating material, some plastic on the outside, um, and we've got some metal here as well, different metal. And the point about circuits is that they all have either insulating parts or conducting parts, and then they have some other parts which we're going to learn about um, involving semiconductors and maybe a few other things as well. But for this evening, I want to differentiate between insulators like uh, ceramics, plastic, wood, and so forth, and conductors. And uh, these are familiar conductors, typically metals. Uh, silver is the most conductive metal we have. Uh, then copper, gold, and aluminum. Forgive me if I switch and say aluminum sometimes. It's uh, as long as I don't mix the two up and say aluminum, al aluminium or something. You know. Anyway, um, some of the circuits you might be familiar with, you pull out a printed circuit board from a device, you'll see these kinds of things. And again, the tracks here are copper tracks, sometimes plated, uh, and the insulating material is usually some form of fiberglass. So again, uh, conductors and insulators. 
So the next thing I want to do is look at what's really going on inside uh, inside uh, a, a uh, conductor on the atomic scale. Now, has anybody here not seen this kind of um, diagram before for an atom? Now, one of the key things about physics is you have to remember it's, it's always models that people are talking about. You know, if you had a very, very powerful microscope, it doesn't matter how powerful it is, the atom would still not look like that. That's just a model. It's a very nice model. Uh, if I was walking around St. Louis with a, 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 a map that was made in 1910, something like that, I'd be walking around like this, all of a sudden, bang. Oh, who put that arch there? It's not on the map. This is the way models are developed. A map is a kind of model of the city. And over time, the model changes because the city changes, so the map changes. And it's the same with physical models. This particular model was developed by uh, Bohr in the early 1900s. And he had this idea and had, oh, the, the electrons are going round in uh, circular orbits around a nucleus. And uh, later on, somebody else said, well, they're not actually circles, they're ellipses. And then later on, we got the quantum mechanics crowd, and they came along and said, it's not really any of that, it's a cloud. Um, so we're not going to worry about that for now, because this model happens to suit what I'm going to try to explain uh, this evening. And <clears throat> what it is, in metals, the outer electrons are relatively loosely bound to the nucleus. So they're quite easy to break away and become available for conduction. So that when you put these atoms into a, a bulk piece of metal that you can actually hold in your hand, if you were able to see inside, um, it would be the case that a lot of these electrons are just kind of floating around, uh, not bound to the atoms, but just like, a, as physicists refer to it, a sea of electrons, so that when you attach a battery, the electrons can start to move and produce a current, which we call electricity. Now, this is in metals. In insulators, all the electrons, they have a nucleus, uh, sorry, the atoms have a nucleus, and they have electrons, but in an insulator, they're all tightly bound and cannot break away, so you cannot uh, create a current, and that's um, obviously useful if we didn't have insulators, um, everybody would be getting electric shocks and we'd have a real problem building electronic devices. So, if this is our circuit again, here we have the battery, and you'll notice that in these slides I keep switching the direction of the battery. That's to make sure you stay alert. Um, now, it, it so happens that uh, the, the guys that first were studying electricity decided that um, from a battery the current would flow this way. That's because they didn't know about electrons at that time. They hadn't, electrons hadn't been discovered. And it turns out that electrons actually flow this way. Well, they had a 50-50 chance. They got it wrong. But it doesn't matter. Um, it's just a convention. So the electrons are flowing this way. Now, if we look inside, um, you know, here are the electrons. Here's the, the conducting. This can be copper or silver or some other metal. And here are the electrons. And we've got positive side of the battery here, so the positive side is attracting the electrons, the negative side is repelling, so the electrons are flowing around here, they light up the lamp as they go through the, the filament there, and this is the electric circuit. So this is in a conductor. Now one of the things that people knew is that when the temperature of a conductor rises, that is uh, something like a metal, the uh, conductance goes down. In other words, it's harder for the electrons to flow through the metal. And that becomes uh, uh, pretty important, as I'll mention in just a moment. So if we come back to the same model, but this time for silicon, silicon uh, has actually 14 neutrons and protons in the nucleus, so the nu this, is the, this whole thing is the nucleus. I didn't draw all 14 of them, but that's representing the nucleus. And it has 14 electrons going round. And in the outer shell, there are just four. So it turns out that these inner electrons are quite tightly bound. But the four outer ones, under the right conditions, can uh, break away and essentially come out to play. So in semiconductor silicon, if you put the silicon atoms into a crystal, 
you get this kind of structure. And here, this, these, uh, this is showing two electrons together. Okay, I know two electrons aren't going to be like this, but this is, this is uh, representing a covalent bond. What's actually happening is like a timeshare going on here, that uh, this, this, uh, this atom sees its own electron part of the time and this electron part of the time as well. And this electron also is shared. So these two atoms are sharing these two electrons. And they're orbiting uh, the, the nucleus. And if we could cool down to absolute zero, minus 273 degrees centigrade, this is pretty much what it would look like. All the electrons would be involved uh, in the bonding of the atoms together. And none of them would be available for conducting. But in the case of a semiconductor, I've got to get my left and right sorted out. This is the laser. This is the, OK. Uh, in the case of a semiconductor, if we heat it up, the bond uh, breaks, and an electron can break away and be available for conduction. And it leaves a hole behind, and I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But this is as we heat it up to so close to room temperature. And what happens is the more we heat it, the more of these bonds can break away and more are available for conduction. <coughs> so what happens is that a, a, a semiconductor will increase its conductivity as the temperature rises. And the first person to notice that this could happen in some materials was this guy, Michael Faraday. And you can see he lived uh, quite a long time ago. He didn't understand at the time that he had found semiconductors, but he was working on silver sulfide and noticed that this effect was there. He knew from his experiments on copper that every time he heated copper, then the conductivity went down. But in this case, it went up. <coughs> now, he didn't understand the real details of that, but uh, today we do understand more about it. And today we know that in a cubic centimeter of material, roughly, there are about uh, 10 to the 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. This is a, a very large number. Actually, it has an interesting name. It's actually about 10 sextillion electrons. And that's not as much fun as it sounds. But there are uh, 10 to the 22 per cubic centimeter uh, atoms. In terms of electrons for conduction, in a metal, because it's a conductor, 10 to the 22, uh, about the same number. In a semiconductor, somewhere between 0 and uh, 10 to the 22. So something like this number in a cubic centimeter of uh, semiconductor. OK, before I go on there, I just want to go back a bit and talk about what's happening uh, in that metal. The reason that these um, electrons get impeded as the temperature rises is because as you increase the temperature in a metal, the atoms start to move around. You can imagine if uh, there's a, a bunch of people here and you, you were trying to run past a group of us on the stage here, and you, you could easily get by if we just stand still. But if we start dodging around like this, you, you'd have a lot more trouble getting by. Same thing with electrons. As the atoms start to uh, vibrate as you heat up the metal, then the electrons have more trouble getting through. So the same thing happens in a semiconductor to some extent, but the overriding impact is the number of electrons that are available, and that increases as you increase temperature. And we'll look at that a little bit more here. So forget the semiconductors and conductors for the moment and think about, supposing we had a problem and we wanted to say, how many people can we shift down the highway uh, from point A to point B? Um, and in order to, to do that, what do you think the variables might be? Has anybody got any ideas of I'm saying, OK, how many people can I take from here to Bush Stadium um, in, in uh, 10 minutes? What does it depend on? How many lanes? OK, so like the width of the road. OK, that is something. Any, anything else? The speed of transport, yeah. The speed of transport is certainly important. So, so that's a good factor. Uh, what else? 
the route you take. Yeah, let's assume for the moment in this question then we're going to go straight down Highway 64, 40. Is it Highway 40? If you're from St. Louis, Highway 40. Yeah, I got, uh, yeah, I got that one. Okay. Um, okay, so we got the width of the road. That's one thing. But, you know, um, let's assume for the moment the width of the road is, is an interesting one because at 3 o'clock in the morning, the width of the road doesn't make a lot of difference, right? But in rush hour, it does. So let's assume for the moment that we're talking about um, a situation where the road is wide enough, okay, and we're not limited by the width of the road, okay? So we've still got the speed of transport is important. What else? Uh, yes, sir, you in the corner. How many other cars are around you? Yeah, that's really important. And, in, and think of it in other ways, how many cars total? Because we're looking at how many, how many people can we move down in, uh, in a certain unit of time? So we've got, okay, how fast is the car going, the speed of the transport? And we've got, how many cars have we got? What else is important? How many people fit in each vehicle? Excellent. Okay, so I've got my three variables. And it turns out that, oh, I can flash the right one here. Okay, so number of cars is important. And number of people in the car is important. And how fast is the car going? So this gives us the number of people per second or per hour, whatever you want to use. If we use miles per hour, it'll be, I guess, people convert to people per hour. And that tells us how many people we can move down a highway. It turns out that exactly the same relationship is true when we want to look at conductivity. If we measure conductivity, it's the number of carriers, that's equal to, uh, equivalent to the number of cars. So in this case, we say it's the number of electrons. Multiply that by the charge on the carrier, which is equivalent to the number of people in the car and then multiply it by the speed of the carrier. And that gives us charge per second. Okay, now, you know, physicists kind of come up with these equations, but they don't like to use normal things like this because otherwise uh, it'd be too easy. And we, so we, we give some special names. And then just to make it extra hard, we write it like this with some Greek letters so that people think we're really clever. But it's exactly the same as the car problem. So this is how we measure uh, conductivity. This, uh, we use um, C for conductivity, or in Greek, that's S. Uh, so sigma, and then uh, N for the number of electrons. E is the charge. This is actually a fundamental constant. We know what this is today. It's the, the charge on the electron. And we use this Greek letter mu uh, to describe how fast the electron moves, and we call that the electron mobility. <coughs> Now, going back to this thing, at absolute zero, we've got uh, no, no electrons moving around. You remember I mentioned that as the semiconductor silicon heats up, the electron breaks away and conducts. So that's the N in, uh, in that previous equation. But we also have this hole left behind. Now, if an electron breaks away, that has a negative charge, and the hole has a positive charge. All right, now, so this concept of a hole... So if you imagine everybody here is an electron, okay, and the empty seats are holes. So let me try to do an experiment here. I happen to know some of the people sitting in the fourth row, so I'm going to ask them to help me out here. Grant, Grant Schuth, young man, could you help me out? You have a hole next to you. No, no, stay there. Stay there for a minute. You have a hole next to you, to your left. Can you just move and sit in that hole? There you go. Okay, now Grant's moved. Now, Anna, would you move into the hole next to you? You see what's happening here? You think it's people moving, but imagine we all had, we were all exactly the same size, all had exactly the same clothes, and we're all clones. We look like each other. Then you wouldn't be able to tell whether Grant and Anna had moved or the hole had moved. See, the hole has actually moved to the left two more. And if Courtney, if you move over, then the hole moves again, and so forth. And this is what happens in silicon. So this electron goes away, but this electron might then fill that hole, and now the hole is here. And then this electron might come and fill that hole, and now the hole is here, and so forth. And if I put a, a charge, uh, a, excuse me, a, a battery across it to develop an electric field, 
then uh, the holes will ha tend to have a drift in this direction and the electrons will go in this direction. Uh, in, they go in opposite directions. So, in order to go back to my equation for conductivity, I have to make it a little bit more complicated. Here it is uh, drawn out a little bit more clearly. I have the battery again. Uh, this is my conventional current flow. I have the black electrons here moving this way, and then the holes are moving this way, filling up the gaps as the electrons move out. So uh, holes go this way, electrons go this way. So I have to take account of both the conductivity. I've got the, this is the number of uh, uh, electrons, the negative carriers, but I also have a number of positive carriers here moving this way. And this is the equation for the conductivity in a semiconductor, uh, both negative and positive parts. And this equation is quite important, as we'll see in just a moment, because it as you can see, if you think about this equation, I can change the conductivity by just by changing the number of electrons and holes in the material. And this is the most important part of semiconductor properties, the fact that we can change the conductivity pretty much at will uh, by changing the number of carriers. So this is equivalent to me saying, I can, I can change, it'd be like, uh, what's that guy's name out in New Jersey, you know, where he put the road construction on the bridge and stopped the conductivity across the bridge, right? <laughs> he was the, the uh, semiconductor equivalent of uh, the governor of New Jersey. I don't, so anyway, um, I don't know whether he's involved in that or not. I'm just uh, trying to give you an analogy here. but. Um, Basically, that's what you're doing. If you can restrict the number of cars flowing, um, that's equivalent to changing the conductivity by changing the charge carriers here. Now, so how do we do this in practice? There are a number of ways, actually, but some very important ways for starting material in silicon is through a process called doping, and we do this in the crystal growth stage. We can add an atom like phosphorus. Is that, yeah, that is the phosphorus one, okay. Um, which has an, an extra electron, and now this electron is free to conduct in addition to the uh, conduction caused by heating this thing up, uh, which is, uh, that's called intrinsic conduction, by the way. Um, but by adding uh, impurity atoms of phosphorus, I can introduce extra electrons. And if I introduce extra atoms of boron, I can create holes. So here you see these, all these bonds are fulfilled. Here, there's an electron missing, so that's a hole. And again, uh, when I apply, put in an electric circuit, the holes are moved in one direction, uh, and any electrons are moved in the other. So we have, um, as I heat this up, I'll generate um, electrons and holes, and I've got additional holes here. So I can make this almost a conductor by adding lots of boron. Yes, sir, you have a question? Yes, sir, they do. Um, th in this case, it increases in, uh, conduction because I'm adding an electron. Why is okay, yeah. Okay, I understand your point. So the question down the front here, in case you didn't hear it, is um, are both of these, uh, in both of these cases, are we increasing the conduction? And uh, the, question, or the, the secondary question is, well, isn't one better than the other? And the answer is actually yes, and that is because we have two mobilities here. In this case, this is the number of electrons times the mobility of the electron, and the number of holes times the mobility of the holes. And I can tell you that in silicon, at least, the uh, mobility of the electron is much faster, it's about three times faster than the mobility of the uh, hole. So uh, by adding a certain amount of um, phosphorus, I can add, say if I add uh, three parts per million of phosphorus, I get one level of conductivity. I add three parts per million of boron, I get less conductivity. Okay? Um, so this is equivalent to a fast car, this is equivalent to a slow car. And this again, is, these are the numbers of, of, of each of those cars. So yeah, good, good, good question. <clears throat> okay. So that's the basic thing about silicon. Um, it's a semiconductor, and we can change the conductivity pretty much at will. 
Uh, we can do it by doping. There's another way I'll show you um, right towards the end of the, the talk. But there were other semiconductors around. When the transistors were um, uh, in their early phases, a lot of people used germanium. Germanium was very easy to grow. You could grow it at lower temperatures. The problem was that um, germanium starts to conduct in summer heat. Silicon, you have to go a little bit higher than summer heat to get significant conduction. But with germanium, it starts to conduct at relatively, um, you know, like leave your, um, leave your germanium in a car in the summer. And, and uh, you know, like a, a, there's an example here. Um, early solid state radios used germanium transistors. And uh, they started to have a lot of problems because uh, these car radios were sitting out in the, in the sun in the summer heat. The guy comes to get his car after a hard day's work, turns the radio on, nothing happens. And it's because the transistors have blown. Um, and uh, so this was uh, quite a problem. And, and the earliest car radios, of course, were still using tubes. But when they started to try and replace them with transistors, this was a, an early problem, which they started to understand, replace them with silicon. There's another reason silicon is uh, winning, or has won out over germanium and other semiconductors, and that is that, remember we said we need conducting parts and insulating parts. Well, it turns out that, sure, okay, I've got a piece of silicon, I can make it conduct as much as I want, but I still need an insulator. And it turns out that if you just heat silicon up in an oxygen-containing atmosphere, it will grow an oxide on the surface. And that oxide is silicon dioxide, which is quartz. It's a very, very good insulator, and it's very stable. And it's very cheap to do. You just have to heat it up. So in integrated circuits, that's a very important step. And uh, so that's another reason why silicon uh, has won out. And like I said, OK, it's, it's stable and it's inexpensive. It turns out you can do something very similar with germanium. The only problem is that oxide is slightly soluble in water. So when you're trying to make integrated circuits, which involves a lot of wet chemistry, uh, you put it into water to rinse chemicals off it, and the oxide starts to dissolve. It's just a bad thing all around for manufacturing. That's why 95% of semiconductors today are based on uh, silicon substrates. You, you know, when I first joined this industry, nine, well, I guess in 73 I joined the industry. I joined uh, what was Monsanto at the time. It's now become Sun Edison. But um, when I first uh, joined, uh, there were a lot of people saying, oh, gallium arsenide is the thing now. It's going to take over from, uh, from silicon. And the reason they said that is because the mobility that I was just talking about was much higher. And... Um, so we could make uh, devices that would operate at very high frequencies, and that, at least that was the promise. The problem is that gallium arsenide has poor thermal conductivity, so if you try to put all the devices on a chip like we do today with silicon, you couldn't get the heat out, and you'd melt the gallium arsenide before you could get very, very high in uh, um, integration level uh, in the chip. So as you try to put more and more transistors onto a chip, uh, you'd generate too much heat and the, the chip would fail. So this is why silicon is, is the most important of the semiconductors. So let's just do a quick recap on what we've done so far. Um, we know that the key materials in electronics are either conductors, insulators, and now we know there's something in between called semiconductors. The conductivity in semiconductors can be controlled over several orders of magnitude by doping. And this is the most important factor about semiconductors. And we know that over 95% of electronic devices are made from silicon. So the big question is, all right, now, so how is silicon made? Well, let's take a look at that. Now, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, I have to admit there's been a terrible scandal over the years. And the raw truth is, it doesn't start from sand. I'm very sorry to disappoint you. Now, in principle, we could start from sand, but we don't. The reason is that desert sand like this, beach sand, it doesn't matter where you go. It's not pure enough. It's just too expensive to start with this stuff. So what we actually do is we mine quartzite. Uh, it's you know, large quartz mines, and we break it up into pieces like this. Now, once the physicists and chemists did this, they got together for weeks and weeks and said, OK, we've got to think of a name for this. And after much argument and calculation, they said, let's call it lumpy quartz. 
And so that's what it's called. And here it is. Uh, it's not sand, it's actually lumpy quartz. Not so uh, glamorous, I must admit, but um, that's what it is. So the question is, how do we go from lumpy quartz to wafers like this? And uh, that's what I'm going to explain now. So we're going from physics now to a little bit of chemistry. And here's the basic reaction. Uh, we start off with the, the quartz. The chemical symbol for quartz is uh, SiO2. This is silicon dioxide. We add carbon, and we get silicon and carbon monoxide. Now, in order to make this reaction go, you have to add a lot of heat. So you break the bonds between the oxygen atoms and the silicon atoms, and the oxygen atoms go over here. And then, as all you good chemists out there know, we have to make this uh, balance, so you've got the same number of atoms on each side of the equation. So that's the basic equation. And uh, I want to point out something. Now, once you've been to this talk, you have to know when you leave here, you can't go out there and say, oh, I've just been to a talk on silicone, because silicone is very important. Semiconductor. Please say silicon. You hear people say silicone all the time, but silicone is something entirely different. Silicone is over here. It's used uh, in producing all kinds of things. We use it for waxes, polishes, medical applications, cosmetics, and so forth. We are talking about semiconductor silicon, this little green slice of the cake here. It's only 3%. Some of the, um, some of the silicon that we produce here is used to produce uh, silanes, and we'll be talking about this in a moment. Silanes are gases. Uh, pure silane is this one. There's also a group of chemicals called chlorosilanes, where we replace some of the hydrogen atoms with chlorine. And we'll see more about that in a moment. And then a lot of the silicon here on this side is used to make aluminum alloys. When you add silicon to uh, aluminum, it makes the aluminum tougher. And uh, that's useful for a lot of engineering projects. So this is how the uh, sand, or not, excuse me, I mustn't say sand, you need more. Uh, this is how the silicon dioxide is converted to, uh, to um, uh, silicon. Um, we remove the carbon. We do it by, um, sorry, remove the oxygen. We do it by adding, putting carbon in. These things are huge, as you can see in my notes here at the bottom. This, uh, this weighs about 60 tons, and it's lowered um, by cranes and so forth into, the, um, into a vat here or, uh, holding... Uh, the silicon, uh, silicon dioxide, or the, the quartzite particles, the lumpy quartz. Now, um, there's something else I didn't mention in the reaction. See, this guy is standing here. Not a safe place to stand. Um, I'm not sure. He, I'm sure he just stood there for a, a moment just to have the, the photograph taken. I wouldn't like that to be me. Now, you, you may be wondering why he didn't die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, the re the, th the reason he didn't is because there is a, second reaction, a secondary reaction going on where they add, they blow air in uh, with all this heat around it, converts the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. Now, he could still suffocate, but he wouldn't be poisoned. So, um, but I think there must have been a lot of fans there or something. But anyway, uh, I, I always wondered when I see this picture. But it gives you an idea of the scale and the heat that's going on there. And, and this is a big industrial process. And we get what's called metallurgical grade silicon. That is to distinguish it from pure silicon. But this metallurgical grade, you can make some rather poor quality solar cells from it, but um, the efficiency is not very good when you do that. And most solar cell manufacturers today go through a purification process, and certainly in the semiconductor industry, you have to go through that process. And how do you purify it? Well, we do a couple of things. First of all, we convert the metallurgical silicon into a liquid, uh, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, then we distill the liquid, and then we extract the silicon from that liquid. Step one is achieved through this reaction. So we, we, we take the silicon and we mix it with hydrochloric acid, which is uh, a liquid. And then uh, we create what's called trichlorosilane. That's one of those silane compounds that um, I mentioned earlier. And we also get some hydrogen gas coming off. And this is the uh, chemical formula for it. Silicon, hydrogen chloride. This is um, trichlorosilane. And this is uh, hydrogen coming off. 
interesting reaction. I think you're going to see that come up again and again in silicon chemistry. Uh, sometimes we abbreviate this trichlorosilane. In the industry, we just call it TCS. Okay, so I think many of you have seen this experiment done in a high school chemistry lab. It, usually, it's distilling water. Um, I made the water. I didn't make it. I got this diagram off the internet, but um, this... Uh, this liquid is purple, could make it look more interesting, but it could just be water. So what happens is you heat this flask of, um, of liquid here uh, and you uh, distill it. Uh, goes to this, this diagram is actually wrong. Anybody, anybody see why? It's, uh, you've got water up here, but you've got the outlet here. The water would never get up there. But, okay, artist's license, right? So... Um, anyway, water goes in here, flows up here, and this is to cool the liquid, so we boil it, the vapors come off, and as they come through this condensing tube, I think this is, if I remember rightly, called a Leibig condenser, uh, comes down here, and the liquid condenses, so this would be like, if this is water, so steam comes up, comes down here, condenses, and then the, the distilled water runs down here, gets in this thing, and if it's not purple, you just put it in your iron and press your pants. Uh, I guess, something like that. Okay, um, so in industrial scale, it looks more like this. Far more impressive. This is very big. This is uh, three or four stories high, and um, obviously much higher volumes. But that's what's going on here. We put in uh, impure trichlorosilane, which we produced from that previous reaction. Let's go back to remind you. We do this reaction. We've now got a liquid containing silicon. We need to purify it. We do that here. Pure, pure TCS comes out. And then we take the pure TCS, and now we've got to convert it back to silicon. Well, how do we do that? Well, we use a thing, we use a process, actually. It's called a Siemens process, because Siemens in... Is that the... Is that the... That's the is, that, is that the rally squirrel? Somebody said there's a... I'm not joking. Somebody said there's a... There's a squirrel loose in here somewhere. So... I don't think it's me. Let me see, maybe my zip, I don't know. Was, all right. <laughs> they said, <laughs> see, I'm not joking, they said, watch out for the rally squirrel, don't let it scare you. Okay. Um, so Siemens invented this process some uh, long time ago. Zebra, yeah, that's right, it is the zoo. Uh, Sean, Sean's coming to our rescue here. Do you know what it is, Sean? Okay. It's on my belt, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it seems better now. Thanks a lot, Sean. We should thank Sean Lofgren here, ladies and gentlemen. He's uh, our technician for the evening. Done a, done a great job in uh, getting everything set up here. So, uh, I, you know, I should have researched this, but maybe back in the uh, early 60s, Siemens came up with this process for changing um, trichlorosilane back into uh, pure silicon. Um, we, we, what we make in here is called chunk silicon. We go from lumpy quartz to chunk silicon. That's because it's in chunks. Well, you'll see it ends up in chunks. We're very inventive in this industry. Um, so we use this reaction now. Um, sorry, that's, that's the forward reaction. This is the one we used this before. Silicon, add hydrochloric acid, you get this, you purify it. So now we assume it's pure, and we now add hydrogen um, to the TCS, the pure TCS, and we heat it up in this reactor, um, and you get some chunk silicon and HCl gas, which is swept away. Um, just to give you an idea, there's no fish around here really, but this gives you an idea of the scale of the reactor. And let's, have, let's take a quick look inside there. Um, this is this classic diagram for explaining how the reactor works. Uh, you put the trichlorosilane plus some hydrogen in there as a flow gas. Uh, it goes in here. The trichlorosilane, okay, I know I said it was a liquid earlier, but you just heat it up just a little bit and it becomes a gas. It's very volatile. So you can feed it in here as a, as a vapor, if you like, plus the hydrogen to carry it in. And then you start off this stuff. This, see, the, the, just focus on the green line here. I'll show you a photograph in a minute. 
That's called a slim rod because it's slim. Uh, it's, it's thin, uh, uh, I guess uh, three quarters of an inch or something, an inch square. Uh, and they put two pieces up here and then put a piece across the top. And then you feed a high current through here and it heats up. And as you heat it up and you're flowing this stuff through, then the uh, trichloroxylene molecule breaks up and the silane, uh, excuse me, the silicon deposits onto the slim rod, represented by this green line, and it grows out to the black line, so it becomes thick, as shown in this uh, schematic here. It, here I only show one simple uh, uh, inverted U, but in fact, uh, there are lots of them inside a reactor. And yeah, so what happens is, here's the slim rod, which is represented, let me go to the next, next thing. So here, I don't know if you can see this too well at the back, but um, here is the slim rod going up, and then going across the top and coming back down. It makes a, completes the electric circuit, so that heats it up. And then as you put the trichloroxylene in, in gas form, uh, it deposits onto this slim rod, and it grows outwards, and you end up with this. Okay, so it becomes fatter and fatter. And... Uh, the, the angle of this photograph makes it look enormous, but again, no fish, but uh, that's about the scale of it. And if I show you on the next picture, see this guy here is holding one of these things. And, you know, if you want to start talking about inverted U silicon, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, so we break it into chunks and call it chunk poly. It's polysilicon. I'll explain exactly what we mean by polysilicon in a moment. But we take these inverted U's and we break them up into manageable pieces, getting ready for the crystal growth process. Okay, the guy's wearing gloves here. In reality, you wouldn't actually touch the, the, the polysilicon uh, like this in practice. You'd have gloves and stuff just because you wouldn't want to contaminate it with um, the oils and things from your, from your fingers and so forth. Um, I, I come up with this term polysilicon. I want to um, differentiate uh, some of the terms that we use. Most metals, you pick up a piece of metal it's polycrystalline. That means to say it has tiny, tiny crystallites inside it in all different orientations, and lots of defects in there and so forth. But the crystallite sizes, are, in polysilicon at least, are the order of microns to at most about a millimeter. And if you look under a microscope, you'd find all these very, very tiny, tiny crystals, lots of them all joined together in different angles and so forth, as represented here. And there's a picture of one, I don't know how clearly you can see that from the back, but um, when you pick something like that up, you can, um, you can tell that it's polycrystalline because you can see all the little grains in it. And so if you cut a piece of, so you can take a steel bar and cut it and look at it, you should be able to see grains on the end of it, particularly if you were to polish the end and then etch it slightly, you'd, you would see the grains of steel, of copper or brass, any, any, any metal really would, would show you that same, same uh, characteristic. There's also another type of silicon out there. Um, we actually grow this when we're making solar cells. We grow what's called multicrystalline. And it's really similar, except that the crystalline grain sizes are now from millimeters to centimeters. And in fact, uh, when we make solar cells, we try to make those grains pretty big, so several centimeters uh, across. And, and if you look at a solar cell uh, wafer, or a wafer that's due to be a cell, in fact, even on the solar cells, you can, if you look at them, they'll be blue, but you can still see the grain sizes. And we call this multicrystalline as opposed to polycrystalline. So poly is from the Greek, you know, many, many silicon crystals, multi, it means uh, several, I guess. And then you've got uh, monosilicon, in which case it's a single crystal. I don't know this lady, I've never seen her, never met her, but I can tell you she's probably about five foot six tall, because uh, I do know this guy, or things similar to it. Um, it's a bit of a guess. The size of these crystals depends... Um, on the size of the crystal puller that it came from and the diameter and so forth, how big the original charge was in the crystal grower. And in this case, all the atoms line up into a lattice. In the case of silicon, it, it formed, the atoms form up in the form of a diamond lattice, exactly the same crystal structure as diamond. Um, we sometimes represent it in a much simplified way as like a cubic lattice, but it's actually diamond, which is um, it's a, a cube. <laughs> Stick with me on this. It's a cube with an atom at each corner and, the one in, and one in the middle of each face. That's called face-centered cubic. And you take another one of those and, in, and interweave it in the first one so that it's displaced by a quarter of the size of a cube in each direction. 
Mm, yeah, too much. Okay, need a diagram. Okay, but anyway, um, it's uh, that's that's called uh, diamond cubic, and uh, that's the, the two structures are the same, except in diamond it's carbon, and here we're talking about silicon. Monocrystalline. What is this used for? Okay. Yes. Yeah, good point. So the question is, what? So what? Um, this this is the polysilicon. We convert it to this for solar cells, and this is used for semiconductor devices, as you'll see in a moment. The rest of my talk is going to be talking. Uh, well, right at the end, I'll show you exactly what this is used for. Um, we use this to make the silicon chips that go in your computers and toasters and in your car and all kinds of devices like that. And I've mentioned. Uh, this uh, micron thing, some of you may not have come across, this is, means a micrometer, it's one millionth of a meter. Um, and that's kind of hard to picture, so I put this diagram in. If we talk about 40, 30 or 40 microns, it's about the smallest thing you can see uh, without a microscope. Uh, human hair varies a lot. It varies from maybe 50 microns to 100 microns, but you know, somebody like me doesn't have much of hair, but anyway. Uh, yeah, if I'd had thicker hair, maybe it would have lasted longer. I don't know. Anyway, um, so here's a 100 micron hair, this big circle. And inside of it, got various other things. A red blood cell, about 7 microns, would look like this. Fine talcum powder, paint pigments. You can read it. It's one of the, here's a micron, about the size of a bacteria. OK? Um, so it just gives you uh, like a, a scale to think about as we, um, so that's why in some, Metals, if you break them open and you can't see the, uh, you can't see the, 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 the polycrystalline structure, it could be because the, they're too small, you need to look under a microscope. Is there a question at the back there? Yes, sir. yes please. The product going in, okay, um, so we make the, we, we purify the trichlorosilane, we get the TCS, it's a liquid, but when it goes into the reactor, we've heated it so that it goes in in vapor form. Okay? All right, so we've now got our pure polysilicon. That chunk polysilicon that I showed you. It comes out of the Siemens reactor, we break it up. They do have a special hammer to break it up. It's, uh, I think uh, made us, I think it's uh, tungsten or silicon carbide, something like that. Do you remember, Bob, what it is? I think you, you, over the years we use both, yeah, I don't know what they use these days. But anyway, it's a hammer, special material. You, you don't want to use a regular hammer that's made of steel or anything with iron in it because that will contaminate the polysilicon. We have to keep it very pure. Here's what happens when we grow. Um, <coughs> this, is, this growth method is called the Czukrowski growth method. And uh, Czukrowski was a Polish guy who discovered the technique accidentally, actually. The story goes that he was busy writing up his lab notes, and he had a crucible of, um, I think it was nickel, uh, bubbling away on the side, heated up somehow. I don't know what he would be doing. We wouldn't do that these days because of all the fumes and everything. But anyway, but supposedly it was there, and he was, this was back in the days when they still had inkwells. And he took his pen, and instead of dipping it into the inkwell, he dipped it into the, the nickel crucible with molten nickel inside it, and as he pulled it out, he noticed that some nickel had crystallized on the end of the, the pen nib. And he took that and looked at it, and then saw that it had a nice crystal structure. So he then decided to grow other metal crystals and so forth. And then much, much later, in the late 50s, <coughs> early 60s, um, companies like Monsanto started to uh, grow silicon crystals using the so-called Czukrowski method. And here's a diagram of, of what it looks like approximately. It's a little bit simplified. Um, but basically, we have uh, a quartz crucible here. We use terms like crucible. It's really a bucket. But you know, we say crucible. It's kind of clever. you know. So we uh, have some quartz here, very pure quartz. Um, and that's supported because, as you know, quartz is kind of it's a type of glass. And as you know, uh, when you heat glass up, it gets soft. So in order to keep this from getting soft, we, it's, it's uh, supported here in a, uh, a piece of carbon. It's like a, an, an outer support uh, on a pedestal so that this thing can actually rotate. And then we have a heater on the outside. Um, and this, this uh, represents the heater here. It goes all the way around. 
And so we put a lot of heat into this, heat this up, uh, the, and it melts. Um, here it is. It's a, these pictures, by the way, are taken through a piece of glass covered in a thin layer of gold. And the reason is that you have to coat it in gold because otherwise it would be white hot and it, you wouldn't be able to see it or take a decent picture because it would be too bright. Uh, that's why you get all this yellowy color. But um, we put the polysilicon here, we heat it to about uh, 1410 centigrade and it melts. And then we dip a seed crystal in into the melt, once, this, the melt, once everything's molten and stabilized, uh, we dip a seed crystal in and we start to pull a crystal out and we start with, by growing a very thin neck uh, and we do this so we can avoid uh, dislocations. When you put, as this seed hits the melt, there's a thermal shock and it creates a, uh, some defects in the uh, end of the crystal. So we, by growing this long neck, the defects move out of the crystal and leave it dislocation free. We grow this part, it's called a shoulder and then we uh, start to grow the length down. And, and we control the diameter by changing how fast we pull. And so in this one, if you look carefully, you can see that there are little striae here, little uh, streaks going round. And that's where the diameter is changing very slightly as the servo system tries to control the pull rate to control the diameter. Um, and here's some, some more pictures. This is. Uh, uh, a puller here, this is the, the bottom part that I showed you, and then as we pull the crystal out, it goes up into this chamber. And inside the chamber is low pressure argon. Okay. And then here you get an idea, here's a, here's a crystal that's been pulled out. Um, again, very inventive names, we have a neck at the top, there's a neck here. It's, we call this the top because it's at the top. And here's the shoulder, <laughs> here's the body, and we call this a tail. Um, so there's the crystal puller, there's the product. That's one crystal. It's all a single crystal, and that means in that crystal all the atoms line up where they're supposed to line up. There's a, there's a defect called a dislocation. You know, imagine, <coughs> so here are my fingers. It's the atoms are supposed to line up on planes or something like that. If there's a dislocation, this happens. But when we grow a crystal like that, and that's, and that's what happens when you do a lot of crystal growth, under normal conditions, but when we grow a silicon crystal, it doesn't have any, none of that goes on. It's all, it's, everything's lined up. It's dislocation free. It's very important for when you're trying to make uh, integrated circuits on the, uh, on the material. Now, the other thing that's important about silicon, because this is a single crystal and all the atoms line up, we want to know what direction are those atoms in. Are, are they like this, like this, or like this? We need to understand that so that when we build the integrated circuit, it's, everything's in the right direction. And so what we do is, we use x-rays to determine the orientation of this body, and then when we, when we know the orientation, we mark it, and then we grind a notch all the way along it. There, and you, in, in cross-section, it looks like this with a little notch. You can see that in some of these uh, uh, show-and-tell things down the bottom here. If anybody wants to come up afterwards, I can explain some of these things uh, to you. So here's, the, uh, here's the, uh, the body. Now we take this, we cut the top and bottom off, and we reuse those. We can remelt them and reuse that silicon. Yes, sir? So when you take this crystal out, do you not know what orientation those, that crystal items are going when you actually Well, OK. So we, we know what the direction is in, along this way. But what we don't know is what it is around this way. So there's a there's a, a, no, a, a notation that we use called Miller indices. And if anybody's, if anybody knows about this, so this is typically a 100. So if I take a, an arrow coming out of the plane of the screen here, it comes out towards you, that, that would be a 100 direction. And this would be, this would be a 110 direction. And I, I don't, if you don't understand Miller indices, you don't have to worry about that. But it's to do with uh, where the atoms lie relative to the cube that I was talking about before. If anybody's interested, I can explain it afterwards. Um, okay, so we take this body now, and this is the usable crystal. What we do is we grind the outside to remove all those little uh, wobbles that we had because we were changing the pull speed in growth. We, so we grind the outside, we grind the notch, we cut the top and bottom off, and now we've got a nicely ground cylinder with this notch all the way down. And now we have to convert that to uh, slices, to, to individual wafers. And, uh, What's interesting, at least from the point of view of a scientist, all the interesting technical stuff has just happened in the crystal pulling. That's where a lot of the real science happens. Now, I don't want to belittle 
all the guys that work on the, the other stuff, but frankly, the rest of it is just glorified machine shop. Yes, sir? Very good question again. Um, and there's a couple of things. First of all, to say it does actually contaminate a little bit, but it doesn't matter too much, and I'll explain why. Um, but we, we actually use diamond grinding wheels. Di diamond is carbon, so carbon doesn't go very far into silicon. It doesn't, doesn't have a high diffusion coefficient. But the matrix that the diamond is held in on the wheel, you also have to be careful. If you use resin bonded wheels, then you can have um, a pretty clean grinding operation. If you were to use nickel, bo nickel um, bonded wheels, then you would get more contamination. Okay? But the thing is, when a contaminant atom li uh, lands on the edge of the crystal like this, um, it doesn't go very far into the silicon because uh, you, in order to make that happen, you'd have to heat the silicon up to very high temperatures. And what we do is we make sure we don't heat it before we clean it. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more to answer your question further as I go forward. I'll, I'll show you where the cleaning steps are. Did, does that answer your question? Okay, so in slicing, they used to use a blade with a... a, a thanks, Ross. Um, in slicing, they used to use a, um, uh, an internal diameter saw, which is like a big washer, and we put the silicon through the middle of the washer there, and the, the, inside, surf the inside rim of the washer was coated with diamonds, and that would ro rotate at high speed, and we cut one slice at a time. They don't do that anymore. They use what's called a wire saw. It's a bit like your grandmother's egg slicer, except it's one wire instead of lots of individual wires. And what happens is, so this wire goes in here across some rollers, across the top, down, and back across the top, and so on, like a kind of a spiral, helix. And, uh, and then it goes back out here, it's taken up on, a, on, an, on another spool. But you have this whole series of wires, and we pass a, a slurry over the wires, slurry containing silicon carbide or something like that, um, and then the, the, uh, the ingot or the, the silicon crystal is mounted on a carbon beam, and we gradually lower it through these wires as the wires cut into the silicon. Um, and here's the actual photograph. It's a schematic. Here's an actual photograph. Um, and uh, that's starting. Here's the web of wires. It doesn't look too clear because that's covered in slurry, and sometimes the slurry is joining the wires up. But when the crystal arrives, it'll go right the way through. And then here, this is the sliced crystal with the wafer still sitting on a carbon beam. These are held onto the... You, before doing this, you glue the crystal onto a carbon beam with epoxy resin. And so everything's held up there. And then later on, we can take this beam once they're cut, put it in hot water, and the, the, uh, the resin will break down and the wafers will break free, and we can use a, a robot to take the wafers off and put them into cassettes. Um, is that guy fishing again? I'm sure he doesn't catch anything. Okay. So here's the thing about slicing. I, I, I was saying that this part of the operation is glorified machine shop. Well, that's a little bit of a disservice to the guys that work on this stuff because these, these saws, you've got very thin wires, you know, 100 microns or less. So very thin wires, about a little bit, maybe <coughs> a little bit thicker than a human hair. Actually, the wires... They're probably about 150 microns, so very thick or a little bit thicker than, than a human hair. And you've got lots of them going round, and they're under tension, and then we put this great lump of silicon. So you have to have very careful tensioning of the wire. The machine has to be very stable, so it's built from um, very stable machine principles. And then we cut this thing. But the problem is, ideally, what we would do is cut the crystal into wafers and ship it. But the problem is, as you'll see, when we cut it, the surface isn't perfect. It's rough. It's got damage on it. It's a little bit flat, but not perfectly flat. You try to make it as flat as possible here. That's what this one means. Minimize warp, bow, waviness, thickness variations, and so forth. You're trying to make it a very flat wafer. It's hard to do when you've got wires like that that can vibrate. So the developments that go on, we try to make the wires thinner and thinner because... It's like when you saw a piece of wood. If you had a very fat saw, you'd end up with a lot of sawdust and it would take a lot of wood to build your project. Uh, same with us. We try to get the wires as thin as possible so the kerf loss is minimized. The, wa the waste is called kerf loss. Um, we try to improve uh, slurries and we try to recycle them as well. And so uh, we have uh, 
silicon carbide slurry suspended in uh, either some form of oil or um, glycol. Uh, depends which part of the world you're in. Some, some countries prefer to dispose of oil, other countries prefer to dispose of glycol. And there, there are processes to do that safely. Um, di different regulations in different parts of the world. We try to make larger webs, in other words, have more wires so we can put more crystal length, more crystal length um, onto the saw at one time to get a higher throughput. And we try to improve the mechanical stability. So lots of, um, lots of uh, engineering, mechanical engineering and uh, stuff goes, goes into the development. Another recent development, and his, so here's what's going on. This is called loose abrasive uh, sawing, which is where we have the silicon carbide slurry, and we try to recycle that and reclaim the silicon carbide. Another thing you can do is take a, a wire that is impregnated with diamond. Here's, here's a piece of that wire. So the, here's the wire. It's a steel, steel wire coated with, um, actually brass coated uh, sometimes, or nickel, and then uh, um, the uh, diamond uh, grains are impregnated in here and held, held in and then you drag that across the, the surface and uh, the surface looks like this. I don't know how well you can see it at the back. It doesn't look, doesn't look very clear from here but um, if this were brighter you'd see that there are a lot of ups and downs and there are also cracks which are represented here. So um, this is often broken and here's the bulk material that we want to get to and you've got a damage layer here. This is often called subsurface damage just under the surface. We call this a relief layer because there, you know, there's some relief here as it goes up and down. Um, it's, not, it's not perfectly flat. So the rest of the, the operation in manufacturing a silicon wafer is fixing the problems that the saw just created. Okay? That's not to belittle the saw too much because you've got to somehow get it into wafer form. And people have tried different things. We tried laser cutting. People have tried very high pressure water jets. Sometimes a water jet going down the middle of a laser beam all kinds of uh, crazy things, laser beams going down the middle of water jets. Uh, you know, uh, none of them work as well as, as this kind of stuff. Remember, what we're trying to do this now in manufacturing, so you're worried about cost, you're um, worried about how, how many of these things you can get through, which so high throughput goes to lower cost. And of course, you're worried about quality, so it's a balance between all those things. So the next thing, when this thing comes off the saw, remember we've, we've taken a perfect cylinder, we've sliced it, we um, now have these sharp edges, and we want to get rid of them because they can chip very easily. So we use an edge grinding wheel that is shaped like this, and this wafer, uh, the, the, the wafer that we cut, spins on a spindle. Um, we grind rounded edges, and it looks like this. Okay, and here's the machine that does it. It's fully automated, all, all handled with, uh, with robots. And then we go through a lapping operation, very similar to some of the other stuff that we've done. And the idea of the lapping, it's a machine looks like this, um, I'm going to show you a polishing machine in a minute that's opened up. And polishing and lapping machines are very similar. Um, I'll explain the difference. Here, they're cast iron plates, and uh, we put a alumina uh, suspension, actually not alumina, it's aluminum nitride uh, suspension um, in there, and that's the lapping grit. We may have a wafer that looks like this, where we've got wa what we call waviness, where the thickness is the same, but it's wavy. And here we've got the thickness is varying. We call this uh, thickness variation. When you lap it, it comes out flat. And this is about as flat as the wafer gets in, in the operation. It's flat, but it's not smooth. It looks like this. This is very similar to uh, um, a sliced wafer that cut, comes off the saw. It's very similar to this, except the depth of the damage is a little bit less. And so it's represented here. And then what we do is we take that and we chemically etch it. Now, Remember, when it comes off here, it's as flat as it's going to get. So when we etch it, we, want, we need to make sure that we don't degrade the flatness. And when we etch something chemically, it removes the damage and leaves a, a damage-free surface and a stress-free surface. We then take that surface and we polish it. So here's, you can see the wafers are here, and they're in holders. So as this thing, there's like a gear wheel there, and these, th these holders are like a gear and then the outside rim is a gear. So as this, it's like those old spirograph toys, you know, that kids have, and it goes round like this as it's polishing. Lapping is very similar, except um, in lapping, these pads are cast iron. Here, the pads are, are um, uh, polyurethane. <laughs> I had to think about that for a minute. Um, I knew I had it in this diagram. So here's a, a blown up view. What's going on? Um, here's a silicon wafer. It's moving across the nap of the pad. 
when you actually look at the pad, you, this, it's not quite like a brush as it's shown here. It's the, the nap is very short. These, these uh, bristles are extremely short. But under a microscope, it looks something like this. You drag the wafer across. Here's the slurry represented by the green. And it's held in, in, the, in between the nap and in the pores. And you drag the wafer across with these uh, chemicals. And the chemical uh, involves um, a suspension of uh, silicon dioxide particles in potassium hydroxide. So uh, that drug is dragged across. And, and what's going on here, there's some, uh, oh, I've got to clean. OK, I can explain this. So there's competing reactions. It's called chemomechanical polishing because it's a mixture of chemical and mechanical polishing. What's going on is the um, potassium hydroxide is uh, etching the silicon. But there's water present as well. And the water has oxygen, so it oxidizes the silicon. So you have an oxide layer. And the oxide layer is abraded away by the uh, silica particles that are in the slurry. So the mixture of the chemical part, potassium hydroxide etching, and the um, mechanical part is the silica particles abrading the oxide. These two reactions compete, and they gradually wear down the silicon and make it very smooth and shiny. I'm going to try and speed up a little bit here now. We go through, go through some cleaning. There are various steps. Um, I can explain this to people later if you're particularly interested in cleaning. But basically, we remove any organic contamination with these chemicals, um, and then we um, remove any oxide on the surface, and then we re-oxidize it with a clean, stable oxide so that we can ship it uh, safely. So that's getting rid of all the metallic contamination and so forth, and, and also um, removes particles that might be stuck on the surface. And then we go into this laser inspection mode. Every, every single wafer that is shipped to a customer goes onto a machine where we spin the wafer and we scan it with a laser. And it's in a special container, so the laser comes down and is scanning. And if it hits a particle on the surface, then some light is scattered. And we detect that electronically. And we can, uh, from the amount of scatter, we can determine the position and size of any particle or pit that might be in the surface. And there are machines that do that. As an example of one, these are all um, uh, handled by robots inside. It's all um, automated. We put a cassette of wafers in there, and it comes out there. Um, there's that guy again. Just give you an idea of the scale. Um, and this is what a, so here's a cassette of wafers, and uh, here's a guy holding a wafer. Now, about these wafers, when I joined the industry, there's a wafer in here. It's a one-inch wafer. Okay, you can see that. That's when I joined the industry. <laughs> Here's a modern one. Okay, this is 450 millimeters diameter. It's not in production yet. It's still in the uh, research phase. Um, right, if you wanted to buy one of these today, it's a couple of thousand dollars. This one's not for sale, sorry. <laughs> um, actually, it turns out if you wanted to buy one of these today, you might have to pay a thousand dollars for it. Interesting. It's because they, hardly anybody makes them, so they can pretty much charge what they like. Um, I can show you close-up views of some of this stuff. I, I, this one's got devices on it. I've got others down here with devices on, and some without, if you want to look later. On this big one, on this one, there are none. But um, let's see. You know, I'm, I didn't do the calculation, but on a 300 millimeter way, or 200 millimeter wafer is 50 square inches, and uh, an Xbox chip is about just a little bit less than a square inch, so there'll be 50 Xbox chips. But if you're talking about DRAMs or something like that, they're much smaller, and you maybe get 200 on a, on a wafer. And the whole idea of making the wafers bigger is so you can get more and more chips during the production process, which is a bit like printing. Okay, so when we get these finished wafers, just to give you an idea, so it's flat to within 250 nanometers, but to give you an idea, um, that's equivalent to making a football field flat to within two thousandths of an inch. Now, in practice, of course, I know you can't make a football field flat to within two thousandths of an inch, so it's not exactly equivalent because we can make the silicon wafer that flat. But if you were to scale it up, that's what it would be equal to. Um, in terms of uh, cleanliness on the surface, it would be, you know, we count the atoms, all right? Uh, actually, you'd be able to tell the Cub fan a mile would be the only one not smiling. Uh, sorry, sorry to any Cub fans here. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's, there's some very interesting statistics. You know, um, there's one I, one I really like is 
the number of atoms in a teaspoonful of water is equivalent to the number of teaspoonfuls of water in all the oceans of the world. It kind of gives you, you know, you start to get a sense of, of the sizes that we're talking about. Um, so here, we're counting the atoms. We, we get down to about two parts per trillion. That's equivalent to, you know, those little eye droppers. You take, put two drops out of that into an Olympic swimming pool. That's how pure the silicon is in, in, the, in the bulk silicon that we produce. I like this one, too. It's smooth. We get it down to one angstrom, or so 0.1 nanometers over a 100 micron scale. And uh, that's equivalent to smoothing out Missouri so there's no bumps higher than six inches. Now, of course, you can never do that, but um, but uh, just gives you an idea of you if you start thinking about uh, the uh, the scale of these things. So that's a finished uh, silicon wafer. What have we learned? There are 12 process steps to convert sand to uh, silicon. These are the steps we've been through each of them. Very important thing to remember: it ain't really sand; it's lumpy quartz. Shock scandal. And then, okay, so we got the wafer, so now what do we do with it? And here's the really interesting thing, I think, from the point of view. We take a wafer. This represents the cross-section of a wafer. And I'm going to say we've made it, during crystal growth, we put some boron in, so it's p-type. Okay? So this is what a semiconductor house would do. Somebody like uh, Intel, it's a very simplified view of what they do, but okay. They take a wafer at Intel, say, and they inject, uh, they implant some uh, boron. And, uh, excuse me, this, uh, sorry, p-type wafer, that's already got boron in it. They implant phosphorus in, in here and make it n-type. Okay, and they make two pads like this. Um, as you'll see in a moment, we call one the source and one the drain. But they do this by, they take the um, uh, phosphorus atoms and they put them in a machine called an ion implanter. They ionize uh, a gas with phosphorus in it, and they accelerate the phosphorus to very high speed, and it hits the silicon so fast that it embeds itself in the surface, just a few microns in. Okay, actually a fraction of a micron, and they heat it to diffuse it in a little bit further. Then we grow an oxide on the surface, and then we put some metal on top of that in these places. And yeah, this is called a basic MOS transistor structure. And the, uh, my laser pointer over here. MOS stands for metal oxide semiconductor because that is the basic structure that we have here. Metal oxide semiconductor. So this is the MOS transistor. And then we add some contacts to it, a source, drain. And this thing's called a gate because it's the gate we can open or close to control the flow of electrons. So this is a basic structure of an MOS transistor. And I'm going to very quickly show you how that works. I'm almost done here. This is the basic structure that I just showed on the previous slide. OK. Um, and if we start to look for where the electrons and holes are, it would look something like this if we just let it sit there. We th remember, the, uh, the base wafer is, is p-type. It's got boron in it. We put phosphorus into these parts to make it n-type. And it just sits there, and, and you can put a, a battery across here, but nothing much will happen. Um, we can uh, put, a, uh, put a, a charge, a negative charge on here, and we can attract all these holes. Um, but if you put uh, a charge across here, a battery across here now, it still wouldn't conduct. Because if, if there are electrons here and here, we need to make electrons come into this space to make it conduct. And we can do that by putting a positive charge here. So we add a positive charge here. It induces a negative charge here. Now, when we connect a battery across here, it will conduct. We go through here. So we have a device now where we are changing the conductivity. Remember we said in a semiconductor, you can change the conductivity by orders of magnitude. And this is what we do. Just by adding a small voltage here, we can control a larger voltage connected between the source and the drain and turn things on and off. That sounds like a very basic thing, and, and it is, just at that level. But what's very interesting about this whole technology is that is the basic building block for most of the electronics that we have around. There are a few special devices and things, but that's the basic building block. And remember, some of you may have heard of Moore's Law. This is, comes from, it's not really a physical law, it's an observation. Gordon Moore from Intel, back in the 60s, after 
a uh, few years, he, he came along and said, you know what? He said, the number of transistors on a chip is doubling about every 18 months. And what's remarkable about that is he observed this down here, you know, early 70s. Maybe he had three points or something like that. He had a few back here maybe. But this law has gone, yeah, it's wobbled a bit, but it's pretty much gone on through 2005 and it's still going. We're up, up here somewhere now. And this is the basic building block. All they've done in these microprocessors is change the way in which each of these devices are interconnected. Okay? So they take um, a device like this and, and back here, you know, back in 1975, you had about 10,000 of these on one chip. Okay, in 2005, you had close to 100 million. And, you know, they went past a billion a while back. These days, they have a chip that's this size. It's less than 20 millimeters, so that's less than an inch on a side. And they have 5 billion transistors. And that's the Xbox chip. 5 billion transistors built with this basic building block into this, uh, into this device. And all that technology is enabled by silicon wafers such as the ones that I held up and the ones that I've described to you today. So that's the end of my talk, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll uh, happily <laughs> take questions. Sure. Um, okay. There's in interesting two questions there. What's next? And a question on graphene. Well, graphene might be one of the things that's next. Graphene is uh, a single layer. Well, it, okay, it's a single layer of carbon, and typically it's made today mostly by putting it on copper, and it's used in. Uh, uh, and then uh, you, you make it on copper, and then you transfer it, say, to a piece of glass, and you can use it on touch screens and things like that. Um, in terms of uh, semiconductors and, and, and uh, graphene on silicon, that is still in the research phase. Um, it could be used, and people have talked about getting terahertz transistors. Um, so um, you know, frequencies up to 10 to the 12 hertz, uh, in principle, might be achieved on, on uh, graphene. The thing is, a single layer of graphene doesn't have, uh, uh, I'm assuming since you asked graphene, you understand about band gaps and things. I haven't talked about band gaps tonight. Um, I tried to avoid that um, for this talk, but graph semiconductors have a, a thing called a band gap. It's part of another a model of how semiconductors work. And single layer of graphene does not have a band gap, but two or three layers would have a band gap. And so if we can control the number of layers, and it's possible in principle that you can use graphene for very high frequency electronics and, um, and something clever things like that. Uh, it's more likely, however, that it will be used um, in sensors because you can chemically functionalize a, a, a single layer of graphene to um, make it sensitive to other chemicals that are around. And you functionalize it in a specific way using certain chemicals that then make it uh, sensitive to a third particle, uh, so, so a third chemical, um, such that um, you know, I functionalize it with chemical A. And then when chemical B comes along, the electronic properties of the graphene change. And so um, it's, it's likely that graphene will be used first in, in these kinds of sensors. Um, but graphene by itself is also a very strong material. It's among the strongest. And actually, I said earlier that silver is the, uh, the best conductor. It's the best metal conductor. But in actual fact, graphene beats silver. So there could be some uses there. But there are still some difficulties in getting it uniform across the surface of wafers and integrating it into current technologies. And that's one thing that might come next. And then there are other, there are other semiconductors out there. One thing about silicon, one thing silicon can't do is, is uh, be um, uh, a light emitting source. So we use other materials for that. And that's a, another big thing that's, go that's going on. I, so there's one, one question at the back, and I'll come back to you in a moment. So Yes, sir. Okay, uh, the question, uh, did you all hear that? It was asking about the, the depiction there. I depicted what's called an MOS transistor, and uh, it was kind of NPN, but N the term NPN is usually <coughs> reserved for what's known as a bipolar transistor, 
um, and the structure of that is actually slightly different, but uh, largely similar in, in its behavior. Uh, this was a voltage-controlled device, and a bipolar transistor is a current-controlled device, but uh, many similarities between the two. You had a follow-up question? Metal oxide semiconductor. It's the structure I put up there, do you remember? Um, where we had the, the three layers. Um, I'll get back to that for you. Okay, there's a question down here. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how the mobility of an electron is affecting the state of the whole. Because you think about the music that comes in, and how the whole music is in the music. Yeah, the explanation of that is that my model of getting the people to move is, is not perfect. <laughs> yeah. Right. The reason is because it takes a little bit of time for another electron to come along and fill it before the hole moves again. The, elec the electron that escaped is now moving. But it takes, so okay, so Grant, would you, you move over there, all right? Okay, so now the, the hole's moved to there and he's already where he's going. And the hole is there, but the hole is, it, you know, now it's not going to move and, uh, until Anna moves over one more time. So there's a delay and that's why the holes move a little. So it's, it's because it's a multi-step process to move a hole once. Once the electron's free, it's gone. All right, is that? Again, it's all models, but yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Um, typically, at that stage, we, we would not remelt them. We might use them, if they were from a solar line, we might, excuse me, from a semiconductor line, we might use them in a, a solar uh, application. Um, but by that stage, because you've got a large surface area, there's too much risk of contamination, and so we typically, it's, it would not be worthwhile to, um, to recycle them. We, now, what can happen, depending on the specification the customer wants, we might sell them as uh, second grade wafers or something like that. And that's typically what happens in a, in a production line. You've got gr you know, prime grade and then second grade and so forth. <laughs> no, it <laughs> doesn't quite work like that, but I, I take your point. But it's <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, one more here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question down the front here is what's the growth time for growing these? Uh, you're very susceptible. All those, all those pullers are mounted on special vibration-free mounts and stuff like that. The typical growth time depends on the, the size of the crystal. Um, sorry, I mustn't do that. Um, typical, uh, so uh, if you started, you're trying to grow a 100 millimeter crystal, it takes about a day. If you're growing a 200 millimeter crystal, it takes two days. 300 millimeter, about three days. R order, order of magnitude. It, it depends on a lot of things, but that's typical of uh, what it costs. So I got, I, I, let, me, let me get a couple of questions down the front. I'll come back to you in a, in a, in a second. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. So the question here is, when you get five billion transistors on a chip, for example, and they're packed so tightly, don't the transistors get confused, you know, because they're so, so small and close together? And the answer is yes, they do. And we have to put in the, one of the phenomena that uh, uh, relates to that. It's called latch up. We've got two transistors next to each other, and you try to, t you know, we've got this one supposed to be off, and this one, you, you switch it on. So it goes on, and all of a sudden, this guy, even though you haven't said anything, oh, I want to be on too. And now you've got something's wrong. So you have to design things so that doesn't happen. And there's a way to do that, which um, we use what's, what's known as an epitaxial layer. Put another layer of silicon over the top. And so you actually, where's my laser pointer? You actually make, um, it, would, it would be like, this is the layer you're building your crystal. This would be the epi layer. And the original substrate would be what's called here the body. This, that's not what they meant here. But th and it would be thicker than this. But that would be... Um, very heavily doped, so it'd be almost like a conductor. That'd be like putting a copper plane on the back of a printed circuit board, and it prevents that from happening, because you get the phenomenon you're referring to is when you get um, this so-called latch-up, is because you're getting parasitic effects in, in the wafer, 
But yes, so the answer is yes, they do, and you have to take precautions to stop that from happening. So, that, yes, so you had a question at the back there. Okay, so getting into solar panels, a little bit different subject, but the, um, okay, so the major, the typical solar panel, the best efficiency you can get is about 30% on a silicon solar panel, it's a bit less than that, 20, 28%, something like that, in a silicon solar panel. And there are some fundamental physics reasons why you can't get beyond that. Uh, that's because um, the energy coming from the sun has to match the energy of the silicon to create what's called an electron and a hole pair, like we had here. You know, create an electron and a hole, and they have to diffuse the front and back. Um, and a lot of the, the light coming from the sun doesn't have enough energy. The photons coming from the sun doesn't have enough energy to create the electron hole pair as part of it. But in terms of efficiency, what, what can we do to um, improve the efficiency of, of the part that you can control? We have to make it purer and purer. And if you have impurities in there, what happens? Those impurities act like traps, and the electron and the hole have to get to the front and back surface of a solar cell in order con to contribute to the current. And if you've got metallic impurities in the way, those electrons and holes get trapped at the metallic impurities, and they never get to the front and back surface, the contacts of the solar cell, so they never contribute to the current. So very, it's a little bit oversimplified, but... Um, Basically, that's the, one of the key limitations, is how pure can you make the, the silicon. And there are other losses, like losses because you've got contacts on the front, and then you've got reflections instead of absorptions and stuff like that. Yes, sir? This size? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so the question is, what, what new processes have come along um, that allow us to make wafers of this size? Um, well, the very basic and simple answer is um, essentially none, but we have to make the processes better. Okay? Now, there are some key things. Uh, one, one of the key things is going from, I remember I said when we were slicing, we used to have that, uh, what was called an internal diameter saw. It's like a big, a big washer, I mean, it's like this size, with a hole about this size in the middle. And then in those days, it would be, this is a little bit of an exaggeration. Here's a two-inch crystal, okay? So we'd have, there would be a, a, a washer around this, and it would be spinning at very high speed, and on the inside edge, it would be impregnated with diamond. And we'd lower the blade through the saw one slice. It'd be like cu cutting a piece of salami, literally. Zoop, slice comes off, another one, cutting one at a time. If we tried to make these wafers doing that, it would take forever. It would be way too expensive. So the key thing for making wafers of this size is, first of all, um, to make processes that are, that are faster. Okay? And the wire saw is a good example. Other than that, pretty much the same processes have been used. The same uh, lapping, polishing. We did try grinding. Grinding was an alternative process. Instead of lapping, we would grind the wafer flat. And that's kind of useful because you can automate grinding, but it's very expensive. The machines that do that are so expensive, and the results are not quite as good. You get that waviness in the slide I showed. Um, if you had a wafer that has waviness, when you grind it, you put pressure on it. So the pressure, flatten, the pressure of the grinding wheel flattens it out and grinds it. And then when the grinding wheel goes, it springs back. In lapping, that doesn't happen. So. Basically, the answer is there's no new processes, but we make the processes better, better engineered. They have to be more stable. They have to be faster. They have to make them lower cost. And the machines have to be bigger, a lot bigger. So that adds to the cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right, yes, very, very good. This, this gentleman was alert. So what happens, um, he, he said when, when you're trying to make these very big crystals, the pull rate, is, is that going to be slower? And the answer is yes. So it takes much longer to grow a large crystal because when I mean, you think about it logically, you have to get all that heat out. You have to go from a very hot melt to a cooler crystal. It takes time for that heat to come out, which is why we have to pull slower. So yes, very good observation. And the other th there, is a, there are a couple of additions we've done as well. We've added, we actually add a magnetic field to the puller. 
and by adding, putting a magnetic field there, you can actually control the convection currents in a melt. If you're growing in a small crystal like this, it's not too much of a problem, but when your, crystal, when your crucible is this wide, you know, there's a lot of potential slopping and, and currents, of convection currents, eddy currents that can form in that melt because of all the heat, and you want to control that, so you use a magnetic field to slow it all down. That's enough. But other than that, it's basically the same process. Yes, sir? Ah, yeah, okay. That, that's, a, that, that's another uh, good question. Um, let me go back to that picture if I can find it. The answer is, if we just pulled it out, the answer would be yes. And there's actually an example. Oh, I've got it in my bag. I've got an example. I'll show you afterwards. There's an example in my bag. Um, I lift it in my bag because it's got sharp edges, and I don't want people to come down here and cut themselves, but I can show it to you. Um, we'll do it carefully. Um, I've got to go back a bit. What happens is, um, when you pull the crystal out, if you just did that, you would indeed get uh, thermal shock. That's why we have this tail. And you see it's like a cone. And the reason is, if you just have thermal shock, you would create dislocations exactly the same way as you would when you put the seed in. But it so happens in silicon, remember it's, it's cubic, and it, when you create these defects, they will slide on a, a uh, the dislocations that you create go on a glide plane at 45 degrees to the, to the uh, melt interface, like that. So you, for, when you create that thermal shock, if I were just to pull it, let me get my pointer, what do I do with it, it's in my pocket. Um, if you just pull it out, now I'm messed up here, which way do I go? Okay. If I pull it out here, the dislocations would glide back on a 45 degree plane, meaning I'd lose one diameter of the rod, it would have those dislocations in it. So what I do is, during growth, right at the end, I start to pull faster, and then the diameter goes down, and when I pull it out here, it goes back one diameter, but I don't care because it's just such a small distance. And that's why we grow that tail like that, to avoid that thermal shock. Right. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. So the, the doping is right here. We add the, the phosphorus or boron to the melt. And it's a very tiny amount. What we actually do is we buy some dopant material, um, which is a silicon with a small amount of boron in it, or a silicon with a small amount of phosphorus in it, and we add that to the melt here. Okay, and that's, what, that's at the stage. Because um, the actual um, um, amount that you add, you know, I said there are 10 to the 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. You're typically adding uh, the order of 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 atoms uh, per cubic centimeter of, of dopant. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, what's that, 10 to the 16, that will be at one millionth of the, uh, of the concentration. So, Grant, you had a question. Uh, Grant's question is, uh, what happens to the top and the tail part? And the answer to that is, that we do recycle. So we cut, uh, which way, I've got to go this way, yeah. Uh, we cut the bottom off and the top, and we take that back and we will melt that down. And it turns out that, that this is actually purer than the original polysilicon. And the reason is that uh, when you're growing, the impurities prefer to stay in the liquid phase um, uh, than the uh, solid phase. So as you pull this out when it becomes solid, all the impurities are staying behind in the liquid. And uh, not, well, not all of them, but most of them are staying behind in the liquid. And the solid stuff is actually purer than the starting material. It's called uh, uh, segregation, is the, is the name given to it. Yes, sir? With what residue? So, ah, okay. Um, we try to recycle that, reclaim it, and uh, solar guys like to use it. So when we saw and we get the, the uh, silicon residue, the silicon dust, and there's a lot of it, especially in um, the solar industry, because you also have to make slices in the solar industry, we try to recycle that. But there's, there's some problems doing that. One is contamination, and the other is when you have a lot of silicon dust, it's much harder to melt than a solid piece of silicon because there are a lot of air gaps in it. So you have to put a lot of heat in in order to make it melt. So there's some engineering problems associated with that, but that's basically what we do. Yes, sir. Why are you, 
Yes, they do, because um, we do have them under enough tension to withstand the pressure that we put on. Yes, yeah. So those wires are specially made, and they come on reels containing a few hundred, maybe a thousand kilometers or something like that of wire, but it's very thin wire. It comes on a, you know, a big reel like this, many, many turns. Well, in the solar industry, they're starting to use diamond impregnated wire, yes. But most of the semiconductor industry still uses uh, the slurry version. Yeah, there's some, there's some issues associated with uh, the diamond wire case, but, um, which the solar industry doesn't mind. But um, I think eventually the whole industry will use a diamond coated wire, uh, the diamond impregnated wire. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a little more expensive, um, but the throughput is higher. Um, so, and there's some issues because when you put the diamonds in, the wires tend to break a little more easily. Yes, sir. What's the oh. Downfall from? Yeah, why, why is the water jet not this direction? Oh, okay. Um, I, it was a, just a throughput issue. You know, if you get if you make the water jet with high enough pressure, you can under under very high pressure, ma materials um, behave like liquids. So the idea was if you got a high enough pressure, but you couldn't get the uniformity of cutting. You get deflection of the water jet. You couldn't get it to stay, you know, keep the wafer without that bow and, and warp has, you know, come out like this, like, more like a potato chip than a flat slice. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, they they don't. I think okay. So what, what you're referring to, they they today they use resistive heating in Shukrowski growth. Um, but I can understand, you, you obviously know something about crystal pulling because uh, that carbon support that I mentioned that goes around the outside of the quartz crucible is called a susceptor. The name is left over from the days when they used to do what's called a float zone process, which was inductively heated. And the reason they use the high frequency is to get the correct, correct uh, the, the, mo the optimum induction frequency so that the, the, it was the optimum frequency to couple in with the silicon. If you're using a different material, you may have to use a different material, but that, that was the reason for the high frequency. But they don't use that today. It's all resistive. Yeah. Yes, sir? It's a steel wire with a... Um, uh, well, I think there may be a couple of choices. Because when, when, when you try to make steel wire like that or um, grinding wheels, um, you have what's called a bond material. And they can use resin bonded or metal bonded materials and they each have their advantages and disadvantages. One of the problems is when diamonds break out of a, a bond like that, they can create scratches and deep gouges and stuff like that. Um, and then on the other hand, when you put those diamonds into a, a thin wire, um, it can create problems in the wire and kind of create a gouge in the wire which makes it weak and, and potentially breakable at that point. So there's still a lot of technolo technological developments going on in developing that wire. Yeah, yeah. But basically, it's a steel wire. Um, it's, it's, it's strong and it's coated. And then, uh, we, you know, we mentioned earlier about the potential for, the for contamination. Um, what I should say, after slicing, there's a, there's a, a, a rough cleaning process. Uh, and then um, there was the final cleaning process, and that removes all, all the metals. So it's very important to get those wafers very clean, from especially clean of, of metals, before you heat the wafer, because once you heat it, that metal will diffuse into the bulk, and now it becomes a, a permanent uh, fixture in the, in, the, in the silicon, and it kind of ruins the wafer. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we've never done public tours per se, although we have, done, we have toured small groups from universities and things, but that was a few years ago, and, and unfortunately, at the St. Peter's plant today, we don't... Um, we don't do much manufacturing. Most of the manufacturing today has necessarily moved to Asia. It's, um, it's very sad, but uh, it's a fact of life that in order to compete in this market, um, we have to manufacture in low-cost areas of the world, just like our competitors. And uh, so our manufacturing oper operations today are in uh, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and Malaysia, mostly. We have some in Italy, a um, little bit in Italy. and. We have a little bit going on in St. Peter's, but there's nothing worth showing. So um, I'm sorry for that, but uh, the R&D center is still in St. Peter's, and we, all our R&D people um, 
uh, are based there, but they travel around the world to do their experiments because we use the manufacturing machines to run tests and so forth. Um, but so the people in our R&D operation do a lot of traveling. I think, are we, any, any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. If anybody's interested,